How is it going guys and welcome to the Olufemi channel. We're a group of teachers that want to shore up your video production skills in as little time as possible. Today Herman aka Coffee Liquor is going to be showing you how to replace or remove graphics or logos on shirts. Yo, it's Herman here, and today we're gonna learn the incredibly powerful Power Mesh tool in Mocha Pro and how we can use it to either erase or replace graphics on a shirt. Have you ever shot something only to realize that there was a logo in there that you couldn't include? And then maybe your producer walks up to you and he's like, hey, let's just um, throw like a disgusting mosaic over it so we don't get sued. So instead of censoring things with an ugly blur or a mosaic, like we're still in the 90s, let's learn how to completely erase them from the shot. Of course, it's not limited to just fabric, but I do think it's a great example because of the way that the surface surface can warp and stretch. So I hope you guys are excited as I am because honestly, it just feels like magic when you do it. Now, before we get into everything, what exactly is Power Mesh and what is Mocha Pro? Don't I already have Mocha if I have After Effects installed? I've actually made a tutorial already on the Olufemi channel that talks about tracking creative filters on someone's face using the Power Mesh tool and going fairly in depth to it. But if this is your first time hearing about it, don't worry, I'm gonna try and explain everything as clearly as possible what it is. Let's first talk about Mocha. Now the Mocha that's been included in After Effects for many years is called Mocha AE, and it's known for its killer planar tracking. Planar tracking means that it excels in tracking flat objects like walls, billboards, screens, you name it. Now, Mocha Pro is the paid version that's basically on steroids with its many additional features such as advanced rotoing, object removal, stabilization, just to name a few. It even supports running in Premiere Pro, so you can do your tracking and masking in there instead of going back and forth between After Effects. It's better than natively masking in Premiere Pro as well because when you try it, it just makes you want to quit video editing, to be honest. Okay, so you know the difference between Mocha AE and Mocha Pro now, but what exactly is Power Mesh? Power Mesh is a new feature in Mocha Pro 2021 that uses its incredible subplanar tracking that now lets you track warped and uneven surfaces. Okay, Herman, what does that exactly mean? So instead of just tracking flat objects, you can now track more organic objects, things like someone's face, their skin, fabric, things that will warp and stretch. And if it seemed impossible to track these things in the past, it's now a breeze with how fast and accurate Power Mesh is. There are just so many things you can do with Power Mesh, but today we're gonna learn what I believe is one of the most practical applications you can do with a tool, and that's to completely erase something from live moving footage. Now, a quick note, if you decide that Mocha Pro is for you while watching this tutorial, stick around to the very end so that you can get an exclusive discount coupon code so that you can save money from any Boris FX application. That includes Mocha Pro. For now, let's head over to After Effects and get started. Now, before we begin, I wanna quickly mention that if you wanna follow along, but you don't have your own footage, don't don't worry, we have you covered. You can download the project file that I'm using and also the footage that I'm using in the description below. So check that out. But I do recommend that you first watch through the entire tutorial once so you get a better understanding of what's going on and then try following along with the provided project file. All right, let's begin. So inside After Effects, you wanna make sure that you've imported your clip. In this case, I put it here in this tutorial folder. And I'm just gonna drop it into this icon so that it makes a new composition. All right, just drop it in like it's hot. And then now we're going to apply the Mocha Pro plugin. In this case, I'm going to pull up the effect by hitting the shortcut control space bar, which brings up a free plugin called Effects Console by Video Copilot, which is a free plugin. It saves you a bit of time from going all the way to the effects and presets panel. And all I got to do is type in Mocha like this, and I'm going to choose Mocha Pro. And I'm going to click this big shiny Mocha button right here to begin everything. And it's going to give me this little warning saying that it's not at full resolution right now, and it might be faster, but it's not going to be as accurate. And if I want to continue, uh, in this case, I'm going to cancel because I'm gonna actually change the resolution over here. Right now it's set to half resolution. We're gonna to go to full. And then when I click this again, there will be no warning. And then we're just gonna wait for the interface to pop up. All right, and we are now in Mocha Pro. Look at this beautiful interface. Now, right now the workspace is set to classic. However, when you are first uh, opening up Mocha, it might be set to essentials and look kind of like this. So you're missing all these other tools. So just make sure that you change the workspace to classic so that you can see all the parameters that you're going to change. And now we're going to determine what areas you actually want to track. So whatever you want to actually track, which in this case is the logo, make sure you watch your footage and see if there are any occlusions. So I'm just going to scrub through like this. And what that means is, is anything going to be blocking or going over the logo? So is my hand going to go over it? Is my arm going to be, you know, waving around and being weird? Uh, in this case, it actually never overlaps. Uh, the only time that's close is something like this, but it's like nowhere close. So we don't have to worry about it. But if that was the case, what you would want to do is to first track the occlusions. So let's say that this hand was covering the logo. What would happen is you would want to actually track the hand first, and then it'll basically tell Mocha that it will omit this when it's tracking what you actually want to track, which is the logo in this case. Okay, now let's pretend that this hand is, you know, covering the logo for whatever reason. 
We're gonna take this pen looking tool, which is called the X-spline tool over here. The one with the pen and the X, we're gonna draw over the hand that would you know, cover the logo, even though it's not in this case, but just to show you what you should do. And then you're gonna track backwards and forwards until you get everything. Now, in this case, it stops here because there's some motion blur making it a bit harder to track, but I'm just gonna show you basically what to do. So let's say that's the occlusion, okay? That is the thing that blocks the logo. We're gonna call this hand, oops, not ham. Oh my God, I had dinner already. Why am I still hungry and writing ham? And what you do next is draw around the area that you actually wanna track, which in this case is the logo like this. And then you would kind of track forward and backwards. But you would wanna make sure that this logo layer, in this case, we'll call it logo, you would want to move that underneath any occlusions and then you can just stop this gear icon so that it doesn't continue uh, analyzing and then you can track forwards and backwards like what we did before but on the thing that you actually want to track hopefully you understand what i'm getting at basically track the things that block over the logo first make sure any of those occlusion layers are on top of the actual thing you want to track so in this case i'm just going to delete everything with the trash icon now we're going to start from scratch and i'm going to start from a neutral frame basically a frame where i pretty much see everything somewhere around here is pretty good because I start seeing the letters of the logo over here. If I start here, then it would start tracking without that information. So I kind of want to make it a little bit easier for Mocha. So I'm going to start right here. I'm going to take the X spline tool. Remember, it's this pen looking tool with the X over here. And I'm going to draw around the logo like this. Okay, just like that. Just a few points. Extend it just a little bit. So there's a bit more information, but the power mesh tool is actually quite sensitive. So you don't have to kind of expand it way too much just like this is enough. And why don't we just call it logo for organization's sake. All right, here's where it starts getting a little bit hefty in information because I'm gonna go through what each parameter does that affects your power mesh track. Let's look at the parameters below and go through all the things that we wanna click and check off and of course why we're doing it. So those of you who have worked with Mocha AE will already be familiar with the ones up here, which is translation, scale, rotation, shear, and perspective. But there's a new one over here called mesh and that's the one that we'll be clicking and using today. So we're just gonna click that, you can see the mesh created and the vertices, but we're not going to actually use this automatically created one. And let's look over to the right over here. So starting with generation mode, as automatic implies, it'll automatically determine where to place the mesh points based off the pixels in your footage. So this is usually good for smooth objects or the skin on your arm or something or more rigid patterns that are constant. Now, if I zoom in to take a closer look, uh, by the way, that's a shortcut Z and I'm just uh, kind of clicking and dragging upwards to zoom in closer and then I can click down and hold and drag downwards to zoom out. So that's how you zoom in and out. You can actually manually add points by clicking this button over here, edit the track mesh, and then you can click this, which is add track mesh vertices. And as the name implies, you can add a couple more vertices if you need more information. But I'm just gonna control Z to undo everything. Sorry, I'm switching between Canadian and American Z and Z, but hopefully you understand. Now, since we're using fabric, what we're gonna do is we're going to change it to uniform. So right now it's automatic. We're going to change it to uniform and we're going to clear the mesh, which basically means it's going to erase the mesh that was created. And if I click generate mesh, it makes a new mesh based off this new change that we made. And as you can see, it looks different from the automatically created mesh. And as you can see, there are more vertices and they're more evenly distributed. And this is best for surfaces that'll warp around like your face or fabric or may not have a lot of texture. So now that you know what the difference between the two generation modes are, let's talk about mesh size. What does that mean? Basically, it'll determine the distance between your vertices. So if the number is lower, that means the shorter the distance between your points. A larger number means there are less vertices since the distance is bigger. You want to adjust it depending on the resolution of your footage. Let me show you the difference. I'm just going to kind of bring this up. Okay, something like 55, I don't know. Uh, we're gonna clear the mesh and then regenerate it like this. And as you can see, they're farther apart, which means that there are fewer vertices. If I change it down to a lower number, that'll decrease the distance. So if I clear the mesh and generate it again, as you can see, there are more vertices because they're closer together. Now, this is a little bit too much, although I'm using Ultra HD as the resolution for this footage that I'm using. So I'm gonna clear the mesh. And I found that something like, I don't know, around 25, 26 is pretty good. So we're gonna generate the mesh. And as you can see, we have all these lovely points, all these vertices in this power mesh that we've created. Now let's go to the parameter below, which is vertices on spline. And basically what that means is, as you can see, there are vertices that are created on the X spline that we uh, drew around the logo earlier. So if I just kind of hide the mesh, which is this button here, uh, it says show track mesh, but it's clicked. So if I click that again, it'll still show it. And that's because I have these tools highlighted. So if I click something else like this, this pick tool, then it'll hide it. And this is the 
spline that we drew earlier. So that means vertices will be on spline. And let me show you the mesh again. Now, if I clear the mesh and I uncheck that, what you'll see is that the vertices will be inside the spline instead of being on the spline. So this is a little bit neater, but it really depends on what you want to include when you're tracking with your mesh. In this case, I want a little more information. So I'm going to click that and clear the mesh, then generate the mesh with the newly changed parameter. Right underneath it is adaptive contrast. And you use that for footage that doesn't contain a lot of detail. It'll basically boost the detail up in your footage when creating an automatic mesh for a better track. But in this case, the footage is pretty well lit got quite a bit of information, so we're okay without it. And underneath it, these buttons, as I mentioned before, generate mesh will just make a new mesh. And then underneath that is clear mesh, which will basically clear the mesh. It'll just delete the mesh like this. And then we hit this button again if we make any changes to create a new mesh. And that's basically what I was doing when I was showing you the differences between the different settings. All right, we're almost there. Let's talk about smoothness and what that means. Smoothness basically determines how stiff the movement is for your power mesh to track. You can either lean a little more on the planar tracking data or the subplanar tracking data probably want me to speak English now. So let me kind of give you an example to make it a bit more clear for you. If your object doesn't warp around a whole bunch, say a piece of paper, it'll still warp, but it isn't super fluid and constantly moving. So a higher value would be more effective. If you're tracking something like water, where it's constantly warping, a lower number does the trick. In this case, we'll go with the default 50. That'll work for most cases. And if you're ever unsure, you can just click this auto smoothness and it'll determine for you. Now, last thing I'll talk about is this warp spline over here. Now, warp spline doesn't actually matter in this case, but it'll basically warp your spline that you drew uh, to remain on the edge of your subject. But as you can see, I drew it kind of like around this logo. But if I were to say, you know, draw around the shirt, for example, and it has a pretty definitive outline, normally in Mocha AE, if you were to track it, it would kind of drift depending on how you tilt your body or if there's any movement because it'll keep the same dimension of your spline that you drew. But warp spline would make your spline more tapered to the edge of whatever that you drew over. Again, not something we need to worry about in this case. All right, I hope you're doing okay so far because we just went through quite a bit of information. It can be a bit overwhelming at first, but when you play around with each setting and see how they affect your track, it becomes a little bit easier to remember what they do and how you can adjust them the next time. Once you've generated your mesh, let's start tracking by hitting the track forward button. So in this case, that is this button over here, track forwards, and then we will let Mocha Pro work its magic. All right, Mocha Pro is done working hard. And once you're done tracking, you can play it back to see how well it did. And just like this, let's just zoom in a little more so you can see the details. And as you can see, that power mesh is sticking onto that shirt and logo so accurately. Now, something to watch out for is seeing if there are any vertices that drift off. Now, in this case, as you can see, because this is so close to the edge of the frame, it's getting a little bit wonky, but that's kind of my fault because half the design is kind of being cropped out of frame. If your logo is kind of within the frame the entire time, then you don't have to worry about this. But in this case, it's a perfect opportunity to show you kind of what to do if your vertices get a little wonky like this. Now, if you want to manually adjust, all you have to do is click this, which is edit the track mesh. That's what we did earlier. And basically you can move the vertices however you like to manually move them. And just like keyframing in After Effects, what we're gonna do is we're gonna keyframe the moment before that happens. I'm just looking at this vertice right over here. That's the culprit of making things kind of odd. We'll go back to where it's normal. I'm gonna click this, which is to add or remove a keyframe. In this case, because there's no keyframe here, we're gonna hit that and it's going to add this green dot, which is a keyframe, zoom in, and then we're gonna go one frame over like this. And that's when I'm just gonna move this vertice kind of over here, which is kind of where it was earlier. I can just roughly estimate right now because it's out of frame. It doesn't need to be super accurate. But in most cases, if your logo is in the frame and let's say like we want to move this vertice or something like that, actually, let's move like this one. This one has a better visual reference. You would just make sure that when you're scrub throughing that, as you can see, this is doing a really good job sticking to it. But if it did shift around kind of like this or that, then you would just make sure it matches the same location throughout the track. So going back to this vertice over here, I'm just going to take a look and oh, something weird kind of happens. And that's because uh, it's going out of frame. So that's when it gets a little bit weird. But even if it's a little bit weird like this, when it's kind of out of frame, what I do later on is I'll just kind of crop this area if it gives me a bit of trouble. But overall, I'm really happy with the results, especially this area where you can see all the vertices stick so well to it. But as you can see, there's a little bit of drift over here. Okay, and uh, that's because this, um, if I just kind of hide everything, which is this, enable all overlays, I'm just disabling all the overlays. If I scrub through it, you can see that there's a bit of shadow that's introduced on the shirt. So that can be a potential problem, but in most cases, it's really not. 
Uh, if that's the case though, what you can do is use the technique that I taught you earlier by isolating the occlusions and tracking them first. So in this case, if I was really bothered by this, I would just take the X-Spline tool and draw over that shadow. And basically it would tell the tracking for the logo to kind of omit that occlusion. But in this case, I'm not going to worry about it because it doesn't directly affect my logo very much and I can still do a great job erasing this. Okay, so we've got this awesome tracking data in Mocha Pro, but what do we do now? We're going to reverse stabilize the area that we tracked, which in this case is the logo area of the shirt. And we're only going to stabilize that portion. That probably sounds a little confusing, so let me just show you. First, let's go to the reference frame. So make sure this pick tool is clicked so that I can scrub through my timeline like this. I'm just gonna click the logo so that shows up any keyframes. And in this case, this is kind of where I started tracking everything. That's my reference frame. That's where I believe is the cleanest visual for me to reference from. And when that happens, this is a pretty important step. What you're going to do is you're going to click this over here. It's like an S in a blue box. And what that does is show the planar surface. When I click that, you can see that there is this blue box. It's kind of hard to see over all this mesh. So let me just hide that. This blue box appears like this. And the next thing you'll want to do is click this, which will expand the planar surface. So what that does is expand the planar surface uh, so that it matches the dimension of your shot. And it's important that you do this step because if you miss it, then it'll be a little bit weird when you uh, do the next step. Speaking of the next step, let's go to the Stabilize tab right over here. I click that and we're going to pay attention to this warp mapping over here. We're going to click Mesh Warp so that enables the mesh warp. Then we'll make sure that unwarp is clicked right over here. I'm gonna go over here where it says draft. We're gonna change it to high. So we want the quality of this warp to be high. And if I scrub through this, check out just this area where the logo is. Might be a little slow because I'm using ultra HD footage, but if I just kind of scrub through it and show you a couple frames, as you can see, just that area that we have the power mesh is completely stabilized, so it's not moving around with the rest of my body. And this is what's going to make it easier for us to erase the logo. It's important that over here, before you go back into After Effects, you save it before you exit Mocha. So hit Control S in this case for save and wait for it to actually finish. It'll show this loading bar over here. I'm going to hit it one more time, just like this. Control S. It'll say auto saving project and give you this loading bar. And why I stress this is because there's been a couple times where I tried to save this at the same time as I close it. So Mocha was like, what are you doing? Stop. So I just froze and didn't save any of my tracking data. That's why I want to give you a word of warning to just be a little more patient than I am and wait until it's actually done saving. And then now we can exit Mocha and go back to After Effects. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this layer. I'm going to hit Control D so I duplicate it. Uh, just so I have this layer over here that I don't touch. I'm just going to call it base layer. I'm just going to hide the visibility. And that's in case anything goes wrong. I have this safety layer over here that I can refer to. But this is the one that I actually want to use. We'll rename this to something like stable since we'll be stabilizing it. And we're going to go over here to the Mocha Pro effect over here. And we want to go all the way over here to module renders. We're going to click render, which will render what we did in Mocha. I'm going to change the module to stabilize on warp like this okay set the warp quality to high and now while making sure this mocha pro effect is highlighted we're going to hit Control c which will copy the effect okay and then we're going to make sure this layer is highlighted and we're going to hit Control shift c and that will pre-compose the footage okay we're going to move all the attributes into a new composition like this and then we're just calling it stable and then pre-comp like this hit ok and then now it is pre-composed, so it is in its own composition. But we're gonna hit Control V to paste in the effect that we copied just now. So now they both have the same effect, but here's where the reverse stabilization happens. So the footage that's in this pre-comp is unwarped. So what we're gonna do now is go to module renders and warp it back by hitting stabilize and warp. And that'll kind of reverse the process. So basically, if I play through it sort of, I'm just gonna scrub through it really quickly because it might be a little bit slow with a high resolution. It looks like nothing happens to my shirt. And that's exactly how we want it because all the changes that we'll be making will be inside this pre-comp. So let's double click it to open it up. And as you can see, it stabilized the logo because that's the area that we drew our power mesh over. And here we go, guys. This is where the fun begins because we're going to erase this logo in Photoshop. Now, I recommend using Photoshop because it's more powerful than, say, using the content aware fill over here in After Effects. I found that instead of relying on its content aware algorithm, I want to have a variety of tools to clean things up. So I'm going to go to the reference frame or what I believe is the reference frame. I think that's actually over here because I see 
all of the graphic and it's pretty unhindered. And we're going to save this frame as an image, uh, either as a PSD or you can export it even as a PNG with the effects console plugin that I mentioned earlier. If you do that, just make sure your resolution is set to full. So how you do that is hit the shortcut to bring it up and then you would click this to export the frame. But if you don't have that plugin, don't worry. All you have to do is go to composition and then we're going to go to save frame as and then you can write file and it'll automatically save it into a Photoshop file. All you have to do is change the output to somewhere you want to save it. And we'll even rename it to reference frame like this. And then we just have to render it out. It'll only take a second. Actually, it took zero seconds. And we're going to open it up in Photoshop. So once it's in Photoshop, what we're going to do is we're going to duplicate this layer by hitting the shortcut control J like this. And then we'll just hide the background underneath. And then just make sure this is a rasterized image. By default, it right now is, so you don't have to worry about it. But if it's not for some reason, then you can just click this rasterize layer. We're going to go to the lasso tool over here. It looks like a lasso. And we're going to draw the area roughly where we want to erase. So I'm just going to zoom in over here. And then I'm going to draw around the area that I want to erase. I can be a little more forgiving with the area too, if I like. But just like that, the area is selected. And now we're going to go to edit, go to content aware fill. And we're going to rely on Photoshop's content aware fill. But take a look at the preview. Now, there are a bit of weird folds over here, but overall, it's doing a really good job. Um, you can always adjust it by using this brush over here and just removing any areas for it to sample from. But I'm actually OK with this. I'm just going to change the output to instead of a new layer. I'll just apply it to the current layer and hit apply. And then we're going to hit OK, and then we're going to deselect from that area. And then I'm going to fix up the areas that I think look a little bit odd. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to use this tool over here, the spot healing brush. So I'm going to zoom in, make this a little bigger by hitting the right bracket. Left and right brackets will change the brush size. I'm going to draw the areas that I think can blend a little bit better. I'm just going to remove this fold because it seems unnecessary. And then we're just going to draw the areas that look a little bit wonky. And as you can see, it's keeping the texture while erasing the areas that I don't want. And just like that, if I zoom back out, this looks pretty clean. I can always make some further refinements, but I'm not going to get too picky here because it's just a tutorial. But the more time that you spend on it, the better the results. So what I can do now is hit Control S to save this PSD file and hit OK. And then once it's done saving, we're going to close it and go back to After Effects. So we're back in After Effects here, and I'm going to import that reference frame that I saved earlier. So that was over here, erase logo frame. And we're just going to double click that. And it's going to give me this pop out. And it really doesn't matter too much which one I choose, but we're just going to keep it as a composition and retain the layer size. And as you can see, it is a composition over here. And boom, as you can see, the graphic is completely erased from the shirt, but only for this single frame. Let me just put these two in the tutorial folder like this. And let me show you what to do next. What you can do is you can hide this layer and then select it and then take this pen tool over here and you want to mask around the area that you want this erased logo layer to overlap and cover the design. Now that's one way to do it, but another way that I want to show you with Mocha Pro is that if you go back to this footage over here, go to the effects window, and then you can see the Mocha Pro effect, you can go to matte, and then you can actually use the X spline that you drew in Mocha Pro and use that as a matte. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create AE masks. So what that does is it's going to create a mask based off the X spline area that we drew. So if I hide this top layer, you can see what it's done like this. And then what I can do is create a new solid by hitting Control Y. And that's a shortcut to bring a new solid in. And we're going to call this matte like this. I'm going to click this layer and hit M to bring up the mask. I'm going to highlight that mask and I'm going to hit Control X and that's going to cut it away from that layer. And then I'm going to click that matte. I'm going to hit Control V, which will paste the mask over to this new solid over here. And what I can do is I can hit F to bring the mask feather. that will feather the edges and blend it a little bit better. And then what I can do is change the blending mode over here. Now, if you don't see this, you'd have to click the toggle switches in mode, which will show you different parameters like this. So just make sure that you see this blending mode and we can go to stencil Luma. And what we basically did was create this cookie cutter so that everything within this mask is showing in the composition and everything else will be transparent. And this will affect anything that's underneath this layer. That includes this layer here that's sandwiched. So if I click that on like this, it'll be affected by the mask. And if you click this arrow over here to collapse the mask and then open it back up again by clicking it again, you can actually expand this a little more if it's not covering everything that you need, because with the mask feather being adjusted, it could reveal a little bit of the graphic underneath. So what you can do is go back to that main layer and we're going to turn the visibility of this bottom layer on 
like so because right now it's only isolating the area that uh we did in the pre-comp so we're going to make sure that the bottom footage is visible so we can see everything else and then this is just slapped on top and if we play it through this is what you get i'd honestly give this a passing grade and not think that this was anything else other than a white plain shirt now of course upon closer inspection there are areas that you will want to manually fix up a little bit so in this case as you can see it's starting to leak out from this shirt which is kind of odd right but all we have to do is go back to that pre-comp and we can make adjustments to the mask and if you don't want to go back and forth between your two compositions what you can do is actually lock this window by clicking this lock icon over here and just like that it will lock it and then you can click this stable pre-comp which was where we want to make the edit and you can see both windows at the same time and see how they directly affect each other so for example if i were to just kind of highlight this area which is where i start kind of seeing it drift around it will live update on this end and you can see the changes right after you make them now in this case because there are so many of these keyframes what i would recommend doing is just deleting some of the keyframes around it and just making sure that you are just keeping the important moments like this and then make the adjustment over here and the lovely thing about keyframes here is that it'll automate the rest of it rest of the motion and fill in that gap automatically so you don't have a keyframe every frame and if i play it through just like this you may notice that we start seeing a little bit of the logo here and that's because of the mask feather so you can always do the same workflow as what i showed you earlier you can delete some keyframes around it and then you can just kind of move it so that it will actually cover the logo kind of like that just to give you a really quick and dirty example but essentially it's as easy as that to completely erase a graphic from a shirt now i'm going to close this window i'm going to unlock this window as well and then just go back to the main composition over here and if you compare this with the original footage you'll notice it's a little bit weird so let me turn that on and off so although it's doing a great job erasing it you'll notice that it doesn't keep all the shadows underneath so if i just kind of scrub through this footage there's not a lot of shadows over here but if you just pay attention to this area over here if I just zoom in and then I scrub through it, you can see that some new shadows are being created over here and some new creases of my shirt are more apparent. But if I put the cleaned up shirt frame on top, you know, it doesn't retain that anymore. Something quick I want to mention is that if you are actually erasing a logo or a graphic or something like that and they never see the original footage in the first place, this is actually quite acceptable because they don't even know that there's a logo that they were supposed to look for and this isn't where their attention is. But I do want you to get in the habit of thinking that details do matter. So I'm going to show you a quick and dirty way of faking shadows in the way that I've been doing it. So I'm going to go back to this pre-comp over here and then I'm going to turn off these... Uh, this clean layer over here and then using this kind of as a reference i can see when that shadow is uh appearing in the frame like this okay and i'm just going to use this area i'm going to try and replicate this shadow and basically whatever i teach you right now you would apply to whatever other shadows that you would basically want to fake or recreate so i'm going to right click an empty area like this go to new go to adjustment layer and we're going to rename this and call it shadow like this and then we're going to take the pen tool right up top over here and we're going to draw an area, we're going to draw a mask where we would want the shadow to appear. So I'm just drawing this kind of triangular area like this where the shadow appears. And then if I hit F to bring up the mask feather, I'm just going to roughly kind of do this. Okay. And I can adjust this as I go later, but I'm going to apply an effect. Okay. It's going to be curves like this. And I'm using that plugin that I mentioned earlier. And we're going to just darken the area a little bit like that. And of course, that's darkening, you know, the existing shadow. But this is going to be applied to the clean shirt once I turn that on like this. Okay. So this is before and this is after, right? And we're just going to kind of fake that shadow and then change the mask to something that we think is reasonable and actually looks like a shadow. And then we're going to change the darkness to somewhat match the same tone as what we had it uh when we actually did see the logo so as you can see kind of like that uh, it does look like it's a little bit darker so i'm going to keep it a little bit darker and it does look like there's a bit of cyan and a little bit of blue kind of like this okay so if i turn that clean layer off and on now there are of course still some refinements that you want to make so as i mentioned before the more time that you spend on these details the better the results but i'm going to pretend that this is actually not bad of a job and basically you would do the same thing 
with the other shadows that you want to recreate. So I'm gonna turn that back off so I can see the graphic. And let's say that I want to, you know, add kind of this soft shadow on this side over here, kind of like that. Okay. And then if I turn that clean layer back on, as you can see, it's just as dark as the one over here, but we turn that off. This is actually, sorry, let me turn off the shadow as well. This shadow doesn't seem as dark as this one. So what we can do is we can go back to the shadow layer over here, turn on the clean layer. And then what I can do is go to this arrow for mask two, and then we can change the mask opacity to something lower. So it's not as dark as the other one, kind of like this. So it's still apparent, but not as dark. And then if, just like before, we can just play with the mask feather, so something like this. And then once the feather is up, the shadow doesn't seem as apparent. So we'll bring the mask opacity back up. And as you can see, you've essentially made some fake shadows. And just like the shadows that appeared over here, it's not constant, right? And also the shape of it seems to move a little bit. So what you can do is just like animating any other mask, let's turn these back on. I'm gonna hit M to bring up my masks. You can keyframe them and you just mimic the movement, maybe something kind of like this. And then what you can do is also animate when it appears. So you can change the mask opacity to 100 right now, but it actually starts off as zero because it hasn't appeared yet, kind of like this. So it looks like that new shadow is reappearing, just like the one that was over here. And you can always keep this layer on and keep everything else off by hit M and then kind of keyframe based off what you see over here and try and match it. And if you really want to match it well, what you can do is use that locked window kind of workflow that I showed you earlier to compare before and after. So let's go back over here. Okay, we're going to lock this window. We're going to go and hit this. So it opens up the window for this pre comp like this. And then we're going to turn this back on and also the shadow. And as you can see, it live updates the shadow over here as well. So you can see if it actually matches with the rest of the shirt. With a little bit of patience, this is what it ends up looking like. And even then, I didn't spend that much time on it. So it's not perfect, but it doesn't have to be because as I mentioned before, the end viewers of your VFX shot won't have a direct side to side comparison, like the split screen that I'm showing you here. But congratulations, because you are done. That's how you completely remove a graphic from a shirt or any kind of fabric in your shot. You can even use the same technique to remove a tattoo or a scar or blemish on someone's body. Now let's talk about replacing it with your own graphic. It's almost as simple as dragging and dropping your own design onto the shot. So I'm just going to unlock this again. We're going to close this window. And uh, with all the groundwork that's been done with the whole reverse stabilization process and the logo removal, let's drop one of the graphics over here which is from my digital product called Enter the Future. If you don't know what that is, Enter the Future is a motion graphic asset pack I handcrafted and includes a variety of assets you can use for your music videos, commercials, live streams, narrative films, you name it. If you need transitions, borders, or custom text animations to give your video a modern edge, I recommend checking it out. But we're gonna use this clip over here and we're gonna actually use it as a, uh, as a graphic, as a still image. So I'm just gonna right click it hit time and I'm going to uh, freeze frame just so it's not animated because originally it is animated. So now it is not. And I'm just going to uh, change it so it actually makes sense. So right now it's white. So I'm going to add an effect called invert and that will invert the colors like this. I'm going to reposition it and rescale it so it looks like it's actually on the shirt. Now in this case, I'm going to turn everything that I did off except for the original logo over here. And then I'm just going to use that as reference for me to reposition it. Let's say something kind of like this over here. We're going to turn everything back on. And once I'm happy with the general position, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a mesh warp just like this. Oh, we can spell it just like that. And we're going to change the rows and columns to something lower like four. And what I'm doing is I'm recreating some imperfections and warp on the design. So it looks like it's actually on the shirt, because as you can see, if I just kind of solo this layer here, this logo isn't completely flat and straight onto the viewer or the camera. It's kind of warped to the side. It looks like it's part of the shirt. And actually, it's better to match it to the reference frame. So kind of like this, it's still a little bit warped, as you can see. So I'm going to bring up that logo like this. And by the way, what I'm doing is I'm soloing the two layers. So I only see those two layers and nothing else. And that's this circle button over here. 
So you just want to make sure that's toggled. And then I'm just going to warp it. I'm not going to go too crazy with it, though. If I have everything back on like this, it looks kind of like it's on the shirt, which is nice. But once I'm happy with the changes I've made over here, I can go back to the main composition and see what it looks like updated with the new graphic. And then playing it through in real time, as you can see, it keeps all the warps and the position and the motion of the track that we made to make it look like it's actually stuck on the shirt. Now, of course, there are refinements that need to be done, but this is looking amazing already. Now, depending on the design of your shirt, you may want to change the blending mode of your graphic so it doesn't look kind of slapped on like uh, how it is in this case, actually. So most of the time, you can change the mode to something like multiply. And that usually gives the best results. And if it looks like a graphic that's slapped on a shirt digitally, which is exactly what's happening in this case, what you can do is you can change the opacity to something a little bit lower. So let's say something like 80% actually. And then you can add a fast box blur and just change it to something really small, very minute, like 0.2. Actually, that may be even a little bit too blurry. Let's do 0.1 just to get rid of some of that sharpness. And then that way, it actually looks like it belongs on the shirt. And of course, if I want to change the color to something else, let's say uh, I'm going to add a fill. OK, right now it's red. Maybe I want something like, uh, I don't know, like a dark, dark blue like this. And if I play it through, as you can see, it's doing such a good job sticking onto that shirt. I'm just going to go even a little bit closer so you can admire that work. And this is actually a pretty rough job. So let me show you what it can actually look like once you put a little more time in. That's it guys, that's how you use the amazing Power Mesh tool to either completely erase or replace graphics off a shirt. As I mentioned before, this isn't limited to just shirts. You can add graphics onto other pieces of fabric or you can do cosmetic touch-ups like removing blemishes, scars, tattoos, or you can even add them in for narrative purposes. Power Mesh is only one of the many incredible features in Mocha Pro and because we love you guys, we're gonna give you an exclusive discount coupon code that you can use and save 15% off all Boris FX applications. That means you can get Mocha Pro for a fraction of the cost. All you gotta do is click the link in the description and enter this coupon code right here. I wonder how long I should put this on for. That's it guys. I hope you found this tutorial useful and that you get to use this new technique because now you really can fix it in post. Just don't tell any directors that. Make sure you stay tuned to the Olufemi channel so that you don't miss the next tutorial from the other amazing instructors and myself. Now, if you want to stay in touch and see what I'm up to, then check out my Instagram. The handle is at Coffee Liquor. So until the next time, again, my name is Herman and let's bring it back over to Josh. Guys, we have finished yet another incredible tutorial. Thanks so much for watching. And as always, remember to keep it chill.